Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that knows it'd be tragic if those evil robots win. Here is the captain. Yes, domo gato, Mr. Ribato. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week, we are very happy to be featuring Golden Monkey Belgian-style triple ale by the good people over at Victory Brewing Company. This triple ale tastes very much like most would expect from any flavorful, quality-made Belgian triple. It's boozy, but not too boozy, with a little banana and clove to round it out a bit. It's balanced and full of flavor and character. Garage grade three and three-quarter bottle caps out of five. And here's some of our good friends that are full of flavor. First up, cheers to Susan in Naples, Florida. Here's a big shout out to Shauna in Rockland, Maine. And here's a cheers to Christina in beautiful Scottsdale, Arizona. And a big we like your jib to Kevin in Mays Chapel, Maryland. And here's a shout out to Hope in Waltham, Massachusetts. And last but certainly not least, we have Tash and Dylan over at Lake Powell. Everyone we mentioned went to truecrimegarage.com and they clicked on the donate button, which helped us out with this week's beer funding for that. We bow because we are grateful to you. Thank you all. Yahoo! B W E W R U N Beer Run. If you need more True Crime Garage in your earballs, check out our bonus show called Off the Record on Stitcher Premium. And Colonel, that is enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. This week on True Crime Garage, we find ourselves once again looking at another horrific and tragic case. This one is unique, but again, aren't they all? This week's true crime story starts off over 14 years ago and spans all of the way into this year, 2021. There are three missing persons in this story, and after each disappearance, Several suspects emerge. Some would get the answers they seek but feared relatively quickly, while others would have to wait, suffering for years the emptiness and terrible pain of not knowing exactly what happened to their loved one. Then, years later, when the answers do come, they turn out to be what they had feared all along, It all started back on Friday, May 4th, 2007, when a 17-year-old girl decided to skip a few classes and play a little hooky. Sometimes, unfortunately, we find that the things we are running and hiding from are actually protecting us from what we truly should be running and hiding from. Many times I have found that the feeling we get deep down in our gut, that feeling that tells us something here just is not right. Well, those feelings are often correct. And those are feelings and suspicions that I hope and pray that everyone receives those warnings loud and clear. Because those warnings don't come from your gut. They come from your soul. Call it the truest form of instinctual self-preservation. That tiny little voice just might save you. So please remember that sometimes things are truly what they seem to be. And often evil has a difficult time disguising itself. This is True Crime Garage. Friday, May 4th, 2007, we have 17-year-old Kara Kopetsky 
had the entire weekend ahead of her, and it seems maybe she could not wait to get this Friday over with and move on to better things. And while she arrived at school safe and sound on that Friday, she decided to cut out for a while. Cara is a student at Belton High School, appropriately located in Belton, Missouri. Friends would later say that Cara cut out early on that day, not just before the day was over, but early as in 9 a.m.-ish. Later that day, at 5.17 p.m., Cara's friend Amy Clark went to the Belton Police Department. She was worried about her friend. She wanted to file a missing persons report. She felt that something bad had happened to Cara because she and none of her other friends could reach her. So the police contacted Cara's mom and stepfather. This is Rhonda and Jim Beckford. Rhonda said she had seen her daughter that morning, but not since. And they too could not get a hold of Cara via Cara's cell phone. And so an official missing persons report was filed that night on May 4th. Around that same time, police contacted Carr's boyfriend. He said he too was concerned, and he had last seen her the day before on May 3rd. Carr didn't turn up the next day or the next. Let's take a quick look at the spring of 2007 and see what is going on in Carr Kapetsky's world leading up to this mysterious disappearance. At this point, she's been going out with the same guy for about 9 to 10 months. This is 18-year-old Kyler Eust. Cara's mother and stepdad were not too excited about Kyler. But it also sounds like Cara was not too excited about her mom and stepdad. She was at an age where, for Cara, she felt she was old enough to do as she pleased and she exercised those feelings whenever she felt like it, hence the cutting out of school on May 4th. That normally backfires when the parents come forward and say, hey, we know you're dating this Kyler guy, but we don't like him. That normally draws the girl more into wanting to date the boyfriend. On April 24th, 2007, we have something of potential interest here. This is a post from Kara on her MySpace that says, quote, So life hasn't been the greatest for me lately. Over the last nine months of my life, I've dedicated my life to Kyler. I made no other time for any of my friends nor my family. Over those nine months, I forgot the person that I was. I'm trying to find that person again, end quote. Then just four days later, after that post, this is on April 28, 2007, Carr went to the Belton Police Department and reported that her ex-boyfriend, whom she had just broken up with, had kidnapped her. She's referring to Kyler. She told them she was leaving Popeye's Fried Chicken where she worked, this after finishing her shift when her ex, Kyler Eust, appeared and demanded that she go with him. When she refused, he grabbed her and forced her into his vehicle and then drove around for several hours, Kyler finally letting her out of his truck in Grandview, Missouri. What a douche. I don't know if this is one of those situations, Captain, where they're breaking up and Kyler convinced himself, if I could just get some time with her, maybe I could talk some sense into her, gets her into his vehicle forcefully, and then drives her around pretty much against her will for hours. I'm guessing we don't know what the conversation was, but I'm guessing it was him trying to convince her to not break up with him. Some of these controlling boyfriends will, they they do the I'm sorry game, and when that doesn't work, they get angry. When that doesn't work, then they act like they're depressed. And if that doesn't work, it's almost like they'll keep trying every angle just to get, just to win the person back. Well, this bizarre act scared Kara enough to go to the police, and she wanted a restraining order against him. Her report alleged that Kyler kidnapped and restrained her and that he choked her and threatened to cut her throat while holding a knife. Her petition alleged that Kyler was stalking her and subjecting her to emotional and physical abuse. The protection order was granted on April 30th and served to Kyler by the Cass County authorities on May 1st. A hearing on the matter was scheduled for May 10th, 
Kara's mother, Rhonda, later said that Kara and Kyler's relationship was, quote, volatile and that he was manipulative and abusive. On the 4th of May, May the 4th be with you. This is the day in question. Kara walked to school that morning. And she called her mom nearly as soon as she got there, telling her that she forgot a textbook at home. Her mother then drives and drops off the textbook to the school office, and Kara retrieves it there. But then she abruptly leaves the school at 9.19 a.m. And we have that exact time because surveillance footage from inside the school shows Kara walking down the hallway at the school and then her leaving the building. Right. Her house is just a few blocks away, but she does not walk home. Her family reported her missing that evening after she never came home. And like you said, she has a restraining order against her ex-boyfriend. But what law enforcement come to find out is that she's been texting with her ex-boyfriend all day. Yeah, and I think the first major red flag for the family was when she failed to show up to her evening shift. She was scheduled to work at 4 p.m. at Popeye's that day. And from my understanding, Carr didn't always come home when she was told to, but it was not like her at all to miss work. And shortly after leaving school that day, no one heard from her again. So she also failed to pick up her paycheck at Popeye's on May 9th. So this is just a really weird situation where I don't think that her walking out of the school at 9.19 a.m. that morning was something that was a major red flag. I think, as you're pointing out here, Captain, it's all of those things afterward that are the red flags here. Well, as a high school student, I mean, we both were high school students. I'd say a large percentage of high school students skip at some point, whether it's a couple classes. I mean, look, she went into class, she did a couple things, and then said, hey, today's the day. I'm not going to, I'm not going to be in class the whole day. Cara's family was concerned, and this is what's interesting to me. They're not just concerned about the whereabouts of their daughter, their stepdaughter. Their concern is extremely specific. They say, we were concerned immediately that Kyler had done something to her. Well, yeah, because just a few days ago, he basically held her against her will, and they had to press charges against him. So that's where they say their suspicions were from the very beginning. But police thought that since she, you know, she's 17 years old and there was previous occasions when she chose not to come home and stayed away briefly, that this likely was a similar situation and that she would turn up when she was ready to. The other thing here too, Captain, that's a little bit weird about this story. You know, we said they're all unique and they are, but it's all these happenstance things that are odd in a lot of these cases this same day that we have in question about her whereabouts law enforcement was stretched very thin because later that day a devastating tornado hit nearby greensburg that same night in fact the us tornadoes.com has a fantastic piece about these terrifying tornadoes that hit and the title best describes the devastation the online article is titled May 4th, 2007, the night that made maps of Greensburg, Kansas have to be redrawn. So there was a lot of devastation as far as this tornado goes. It was not in the immediate area, but it was close enough that we have first responders really helping and trying to sort things out due to the tornado. But Carr's parents emphasized that their daughter was not the kind to run away. So on the 6th, Belton PD detectives sat down to talk to Kyler. The family's actively telling Belton PD, this you have to talk to her boyfriend. This is a guy that we don't like, and we suspect all these different things about this man. So they sit down and they speak with him. He said he knew about the restraining order that Carr obtained against him. Kyler said that he had last seen Carr on the 3rd, But he did say he got a call from her phone on the 4th. Now, he tells investigators that Carr called him around 11 a.m., that he missed the call and tried to call her back, but she didn't answer. That, he said, was the last contact he would have had with Carr, but that was not exactly true. 
police got a warrant for Carr's phone and text records, and they were examined by the FBI. The records showed that Carr was trying to skip school on the morning of May 4th and was texting some friends for a ride. Carr called Kyler at 9.14 a.m. from school. She's still in school at this time. The call lasted 61 seconds. She left the building, the school building, at 9.19 that morning, and her phone received a call back from Kyler's phone at 9.20 a.m. This call lasted a minute. Her phone sent a text at 9.46 a.m., and she made a call at 10.25 a.m., but after that, there was no record of the phone, and no social media post from Carr. Detectives noted that Carr and Kyler were in constant communication until the morning of May 4th, but after that, they never spoke again, or at least never used her phone to speak again. And then her phone is never used again after that call that she made at 10.25 a.m. Yeah, to me, it makes somebody look so guilty if you're in constant contact with this individual, they go missing and you don't even reach out to them to see if they're okay. Seems like she took the threats and him kidnapping are basically serious, but I hate the fact that she is having any contact with this dirt bag. Yeah. I, I don't, I want to make sure we're painting the right picture here and we're not stating that it doesn't look to me like she's going out of her way to communicate with Kyler. It looks more like he's trying to get in touch with her and speak with her. Now, Kyler's story didn't change no matter how many times the police spoke with him. But he did offer up some new information. He said Carr was running around with a bunch of different guys. On the 7th, Belton Detective Mike Clark sat down with Kyler for an informal interview where Kyler told him that he and Carr had dated for nine months recently broke up, and he was very upset about this. Kyler admitted to the kidnapping episode, saying that on April 28th, he and Carl were arguing because she was dating other guys. So he thought he'd drive her around and talk some sense into her, but that was it. In the next police interview, Kyler admitted that he and Carl argued on May 3rd. He said that they had argued on the phone because Carl had a male friend coming into town for the weekend and was planning on hanging out with this guy. And of course, Kyler did not want her to spend the weekend partying with this other guy. Well, too bad. All right, Captain. So now we take the questioning on to the next guy. This is Joel Harmon. So Kyler's able to tell police who Carr was planning on hanging out with by name. Right. So they take this information, and now we're going to speak with this Joel Harmon person, see if he knows where she could be or when he last saw or spoke with her. So Joel confirmed to police that, indeed, he was supposed to visit with Kara that weekend, but he repeatedly called her on May 6th and was not able to get her on the phone. He found out that she was missing when he called her home phone on May 7th and spoke with one of her family members. And police searched some more. They noted that Carr's bank account had not been touched since the last time she was seen. Right, so we have no activity on her bank account, and we have her not picking up her check at work. Right. These are items that you're going to look at from a police standpoint and say, you know what, okay, if there were some problems at home, and again, I want to be clear here, it doesn't seem to me like there were really any problems at home. It's typical teenager stuff. She's not getting along with mom and stepdad. And it seems to me a lot of it's stemming from her relationship with this guy. They're convinced is not good for her. Douchebag. And I think the episode of him forcefully grabbing her and pulling her into his vehicle and driving her around for a few hours. Right. Well, that seems to (laughs) seems to back up their suspicions about this guy. Well, they're not getting along because the parents are actually given a shit and they're actually trying to be involved in her life and they're actually trying to be parents and say, look, you, you're still a minor. You're still under our roof. You're dating this guy. He's no good for you. You know he's no good for you. Like I said, they're arguing because the parents actually give a shit. And so from a police standpoint, you're going to look at a couple of these things and say, all right, well, even if there was some stuff that we may not be fully aware of, 
inside the home or between mom and daughter or stepdad and daughter, her not going to work. Okay. Well, she already skipped out on school, but not picking up a paycheck and no activity on her phone or bank account does not really point you in the direction of, well, she took off and she's not coming home. Right. This tells us something else may be going on here. If I'm law enforcement, I want to know why she left school in the first place. Yeah, that's that's a good question here. Now, police did go and search Kyler's apartment relatively early in this investigation, but they came up empty-handed in finding any evidence of any type of foul play. There was really nothing there that they gained from that search. And as Belton PD Lieutenant Brad Swanson said, we don't have anyone to say they saw them, meaning Kyler and Kara, together on or after the day that she was last seen. So nobody that tells them, hey, I saw the two of them together later that day after she left school or any time after that day. And Kyler says that he had an alibi for the day in question, saying that he went to visit a relative at a nursing home with his grandfather. We need to point out here, though, Captain, that that was not until about 1 p.m. that afternoon. So he may say he has an alibi for that time, but we know Kara left school at 9.19 a.m. His alibi does not start until 1 p.m. that afternoon. His morning is largely unaccounted for. And when's the last time that he talks to Carr on the phone? Well, remember his words were that he called her back, that he missed a call from her, called her back, never spoke with her. Right. But what we have is the the search warrant on her phone records tell us differently, that his phone called her phone at 9.20 a.m., and this call lasted for one minute, for 60 seconds. So we don't even know if she's technically like skipping class right at that moment or if she's leaving the school to maybe make this phone call to talk to her ex-boyfriend and maybe he says something that lures her out uh to at least talk to him you know it could be uh, something as i i I miss you uh, i'm going crazy Uh, if you don't talk with me if you don't visit me uh I'm going to commit suicide or something like that. Possibly. I actually don't think that her leaving school had anything to do with him because we have friends who stated later that she was trying to get a ride from us. Yeah. 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 And she was texting other people about it. Yeah. And and after it's after this, that she doesn't get a ride that she leaves. Now, again, she lives very close to the school, so she could have just intended on walking home After leaving the school. But if this doucheburger was aware that she was trying to leave school, he could go and drive up and again, he could kidnap her like he did the other day. Yeah. And we have her statement that she gives when she requests the restraining order that he is stalking her. So this could be a situation, Captain, where she he's actively following her around. Those were her words. We don't know if it's true or not, but he could have actively been following her around and seen her leave that day or caught wind somehow that she was attempting to leave that day. We know that he has actively told police, look, she was going to go hang out with this other dude this weekend. And I wasn't happy about that. So we got kind of a lot going on leading up to this point of her walking out of school at nine 19 on that Friday. Now, several weeks after car disappeared, Kyler did an interview with the Kansas city star So he's spoke with police multiple times. They've interviewed him by this point. They've interviewed him multiple times. They've searched his apartment by this point. But this is also several weeks after she disappeared. So things are starting to get cold at this point. Leads are starting to dry up. This is when he talks to the Kansas City Star. He said that Cara was a fun girl who wanted to live life to the fullest. According to Kyler, Cara had talked about running away to Mexico, saying, quote, lately I've been kind of depressed about the whole thing. I have no idea where she is, end quote. Per KSHB.com, Belton Police said that Kyler passed a lie detector test and had an alibi for the time of Carr's disappearance. But the community was not happy with letting Kyler go free. In late June 2007, some citizens of Belton 
circulated a petition demanding that the state step in and take the case away from Belton Police Department. In general, it was felt that they had treated her case dismissively, assuming that she was a runaway and had not investigated as thoroughly as the family wanted. The family, aided by volunteers and even former law enforcement, took it upon themselves to search for Kara. In one crazy circumstance, a secret team comprising of private investigators, criminal psychologists, and others conducted secret investigations, tracking down rumors and even conducting a search of a private home with a civilian cadaver dog. This was a house that had been rumored in online chat rooms to be, quote, the murder house where Kara was killed. Sure enough, in the home, the dog hid on something in the basement. And kudos to KSHB.com for doing gangbusters work on this story, including an entire podcast on the case. One portion spoke about their search of the, quote, murder house that says, our cameras followed group members inside an abandoned building that looked like the set of a horror film. The walls are sprayed with satanic messages and references to Kara. Quote, this here says Kara is gone, said a group member, who, like all members, says they fear reprisal from police or suspects in the case and do not want to be identified. It says, I did it. One hallway has murder makes me happy, spray painted sideways next to references of death and Satan. Kapetsky has been excruciating for her family, friends, and for law enforcement, and especially difficult because there seems to be so few credible clues. Kara Kapetsky was last seen the morning of May 4, 2007, by the security camera at Belton High School. Her mom says she was excited about getting her senior picture taken and was looking forward to her final year of school. But something mysterious happened to Kara that May morning. She left school either on foot or in a car with someone else. Her last cell phone call was made at 10.30 a.m. When she didn't show up for her after-school job, her parents became worried and reported her missing. On May 17th, Kara was reportedly seen with a young man at a gas station in Lewisburg, but that has never been confirmed. Despite many searches, a reward fund, and even national publicity, Kara has never been found. Well, tomorrow is Kara Kopetsky's 21st birthday. The reward for information on where she is now stands at $80,000. Please call the TIPS hotline at 816-474-TIPS if you have any information. All right, we are back. Cheers, everybody. Cheers to you, Ken. Everybody have a great week. So a couple red flags. One, controlling boyfriend. Don't like that. That's douchey. We have this situation. Again, it could have just been a heated situation, got out of control. Maybe it's just a one-time thing, but she took it serious enough where she says, hey, I need to get a restraining order against this guy. He's stalking me. But the big red flags for me when this uh, shit princess dingle donkey is pointing every which way. Oh, well, she was supposed to go hang out with this other guy. Oh, she was seeing a bunch of other guys. So go look at him. Go look at this other guy. Oh, and by the way, she also talked about running away. So go check that out over there. Always constantly pointing the finger in other directions so you don't look at him as a suspect. It's like a suspicion that you find in the John Benet Ramsey case where you have some of the police department looking at the family as being responsible and the family is handing them a list of 70 to 80 suspects that they think right. could have kidnapped or killed their daughter. And so you're right. It's like, are they giving us a fool's errand here to, to run around? Then 
in, in kind of a weird bit of this story, and you don't see this in most cases, is there's like public backlash where the community saying, we don't think that our police department has done enough. And the police department in return is saying, look, we questioned the boyfriend. He admitted to breaking the law, right? I mean, he essentially admits that, yes, everything that she complained about when she got that restraining order, I did that. Then, yeah. according to the police, he passes a lie detector test. They search his apartment. They don't find any evidence of foul play there. So I, I feel like the police department's kind of saying in return here, I know that you've heard all these rumors, community. I know the public has seen all these rumors in online chat rooms. We are conducting an investigation here. Just our major lead, which would be the boyfriend or ex-boyfriend, whatever title you want to give Kyler at that point, our major lead seems to be going nowhere. We have concerns that he has an alibi for a large portion of that day. We have concerns that he's passed a lie detector test and so on and so on. So he's, he's kind of checking off boxes that say that he should not be a suspect. Well, look, this is a suburb of Kansas city, right? Mm -hmm. 25,000 people roughly, but this is a very tight community. So when you grow up in an area like this, you're normally pretty good at one talking to authority and also talking to parents. And one of the things about Kyler, a lot of people say that he was a charming kid, a believable kid. So I think that played against law enforcement, but I think the community started speaking up when they got win that this alibi wasn't a hundred percent checked out properly. What do you mean checked out properly? Well, there was people at the nursing home that, that law enforcement never ended up interviewing and they couldn't find. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that might be hearsay, but that that's, that's what one, it says in the documentary, but that's what some of the rumors around town were. No, I, I know that I'm not disagreeing with that. I'm saying that I don't think to me, it doesn't matter about, the alibi. And I think, and that's why I went out of my way to point out earlier that, Hey, police are saying we have concerns that he does have an alibi for a large portion of that day. But I'm pointing out that let's say that the alibi is true. Even if it is true, which it does seem to, to carry some weight. Right. But even if it is true, it it's right. Like if, if there's a, a bank that's robbed at 10 o'clock this morning, it doesn't matter if I can tell you where I was at 3 p.m. today. Right. His his alibi starts at 1 p.m. that afternoon. She, the last time we have any evidence that she's alive and well and is not abducted or anything like that has happened to her, is 9.19 that morning. So we have hours that have passed before his alibi even starts. Yeah, basically a three and a half hour window. Right. So police, of course, they are aware that the public's not super happy with their investigation here. As you pointed out, Captain, tight-knit community, they're probably, I don't think that, that their suspicion so much is coming from this alibi portion. I feel like a lot of it's coming from, hey, it's 25,000 people. We know her family. Her family's quite loud about her being missing. And I think it's really just people kind of pulling together here and questioning the authority on on who's supposed to be leading this investigation. Yeah, but good for them. I mean, I, I'm not saying that you're talking bad, but just the way it came off was like the family being loud. You need to be loud. If the family doesn't show that they care, the community is not going to care. Exactly. In, in fact, we covered a case last week where I'm convinced that the reason why the body is still unidentified is because nobody bothered to report the individual missing to begin with. So if... If the family's not going to speak up for the victim, yeah, then then likely nobody is going to. Now, in response, the Belton police, this is in response to the house being searched and spray paint on the walls and whatnot. In response to this, the Belton police did search that same house where the cadaver dog hit on something. Their official report is that they found nothing at this house. Meanwhile, the police threatened to arrest members of this secret team when news of its activities came out. 
the police chief, uh, his last name is Person, police chief Person said in a written statement, I can say that the Belton Police Department and FBI have searched many locations and properties, some with the assistance of dogs. Some sites have required the use of specialized personnel and equipment, including excavation, divers, canine, equestrian, and information technologies. Either way, police and civilian groups were having simply no luck locating Kara. No matter what side of the fence you were on, they're not finding her. They're not even finding additional leads to lead them further along the trail. And so her family was left to wait, wonder, and work to keep her case alive. They lovingly remember and describe Kara as someone who loved animals and butterflies, loved to shop, and was loyal to friends. She got in over her head with a boy named Kyler and feared she couldn't get out. Now, while the Greensburg EF5 tornado that destroyed 95% of the Greensburg city and it killed over 10 people, this tornado, this this thing, we, we should kind of break this situation down a little more as distracting as it likely was in the moment because the reports I've seen, Captain, was this was a series of tornadoes that hit over the course of 56 hours. And so this was a lot of devastation Yeah, um, hitting the state of Missouri hard. And just about 12 hours after Carr was last seen at school, this certainly did not help to kickstart the missing persons investigation. There were other factors that stalled the investigation along the way as well. For one, while Kyler was their best suspect, he was not law enforcement's only suspect in that case. And capped that off with one month later, And just about 20 miles away, another girl just out of high school and only 18 years old vanished from a Target store parking lot. Well, like you always say, when uh, we have a teen girl going missing from school, you kind of have to do the old scumbag pervert roundup. And so not much time passes and we have a very similar situation. And if I'm a law enforcement, maybe I'm jumping to some conclusions because car didn't have any there's no sign of her after that day right so i'm kind of expecting the worst and so there's a possibility that there's a serial killer out there yeah there were some other things that that we don't need to get into because there's a lot of information in this story here that i want to make sure that we cover all of our bases but there was a weird bit in cara's disappearance where she had a a look-alike somebody that looked a lot like her about the same age that lived in another town nearby so those sightings of this other person which they were all later confirmed to be of this other person really kind of distracted some of the investigation as well the incident that you're talking about where we have a situation where we have a similar we have a similar victimology really is a big distraction to this case as well. So this takes us to June 2nd, 2007. This is less than one month after Kara Kopetsky went missing. This is a Saturday night. Remember, Kara went missing on a Friday morning. Here we have Kelsey Smith. She's 18 years old and a recent graduate of Shawnee Mission West High School. Just before 7 p.m., She arrives alone at her local Target store. She is going with the intention of purchasing a gift for a close friend. So she parks her car, walks to the store's entrance, and goes inside. Unfortunately, she is unaware that there is a monster on the prowl in the area that night. And this subhuman likely chose this area because it's a Saturday evening and this Target is is right next to a mall. So this will be a busy area with lots of potential prey. So Kelsey enters the Target. She does her shopping, purchases her selected items, and then security cameras show Kelsey leaving the Target store at 7.07 p.m. Now Kelsey makes a call while still inside the store. Sadly, she does not come home that night. And based off of everything, her family, her movements, her lifestyle and personality, there is zero, zero concern that she took off somewhere. 
This is a situation where as soon as the minutes start to turn into hours and she is not back that night, her parents are very aware that something terrible has happened to their daughter. So now we have a situation and her family goes out looking for her. About four or so hours later, Kelsey's vehicle is located by her family. They find the car abandoned, but it's not at the Target parking lot where they know her to have been earlier that night. No, they find her car in a parking lot located just outside of the mall across the street from the Target. Now, even more troubling, all of her belongings are found inside of the vehicle. The family notifies the police, and the police determine that Kelsey was most likely abducted. So local PD starts their investigation immediately. They take a look at the surveillance footage from both inside the Target store and the Target parking lot, and they can see her being forced into her car at approximately 7, 10 p.m. They go to the mall and see on the mall camera footage, someone pulls up, parks Kelsey's vehicle, leaving it abandoned in the parking lot at 9.17 p.m. In a very smart move, they decide to see if they can figure out Kelsey's movements by checking cell tower records. As per the reports, Kelsey's cell phone last pinged in Grandview, Missouri. This is the night that she went missing. Very sadly, just four days after Kelsey went out alone to purchase a gift for a friend, local law enforcement, along with agents from the FBI, they were able to locate her remains in the afternoon of June 6, 2007. Her body was found near Longview Lake in the woods, about 20 miles away from the Target store where she was last seen alive. Kelsey after being abducted and her abductor and killer using Kelsey's car in the commission of committing several felonies was strangled with a belt and left in the woods. Now we in a very short order go from looking for this young woman to now looking for her attacker and detectives are armed with some very good lead information here because God bless it. Captain, this is a story where the security cameras were rolling they were actually working, and the people in charge had the cameras recording. Well, that's a shock. So from the surveillance footage, investigators identified an older model Chevy pickup truck pulling into the Target parking lot right after Kelsey Ann Smith pulled in. Then they see the perpetrator get out of his truck and walk into the Target just behind Kelsey. This man is described as a white male, mid-20s, wearing a white t-shirt and dark, possibly black shorts. The man at no time speaks to Kelsey, but he seems to have been following her into the store and then kind of following her around the store. Yeah, stalking her, and she's probably not even taking notice. He does not purchase anything. Instead, while Kelsey is making her purchase, he goes out to the parking lot where he seemingly is preparing a Blitz-style attack because the closed-circuit TV cameras got video of this same man now with a gun in hand, rushing Kelsey and then forcing her into her car. We were just talking last week, Captain, about the power of crowdsourcing as we are still hoping that someone can identify the man with no hands, the Kentucky cold case covered right here in the garage last week. So detectives, again, making all of the right moves, they release stills and clips showing this man and give a description of him to the public. They give a description of his apparel and the truck that he was driving. Well, it doesn't take long because the same day that they locate the victim's body, we have people phoning in, hey, we know this guy. He's our neighbor. Mm. It's the putting two and two together that made the tipsters so convinced that the perpetrator seen on TV was their neighbor. Well, it's one thing to have video footage or a clip of a person or even just a photo like we do in the Delphi murders. But if we could take the Delphi, if we could take bridge guys photo and connect that guy to a vehicle, then we'd have more people coming out of the works going, I know a guy that looks like that and has that vehicle. Exactly. And that's what they were able to do here. Very interesting though, because 
when he abducts her, he uses her vehicle, leaving his vehicle behind to have more and more customers see that vehicle in that parking lot that night. So in this case right here, we have a guy that looks like our neighbor, this from the tipster and the vehicle is the same. And by the ways, the great thing about information in this case, it's not that common of a vehicle, right? I believe it was a Chevy truck manufactured sometime in the seventies. And this was 2007 on the old true crime garage timeline. Right, so it sticks out like a sore thumb. That's right. This mystery subhuman turned out to be 25-year-old Edwin Roy Hall. He was taken into custody and, no surprise, charged with premeditated first-degree murder and aggravated kidnapping. Of course, he denied it, but police had him on camera. They found his fingerprints inside Kelsey's vehicle and so on and so on. Eventually, this douche canoe caves in and cuts a deal to spare his ass. Spicy. And he volunteers for life in prison, and I don't think this guy is ever getting out, and certainly hope not, because he wasn't terribly old when he went in. And if this dude gets out and he's still physically able, this monster will do something like this again. Now, what was difficult for Kara's case in relationship to this case, again, it's just one month later. About 20 miles away. Victimology, very similar. It was quickly determined that in Kelsey's case, the Target store case, that this was a totally random attack. Edwin simply drove around looking for a young woman to abduct. So, of course, everyone now has to wonder, could Edwin be responsible for Kara's disappearance? Right. Could he have just been driving around on it on an earlier day looking for another victim? And yeah. And where would you go if you're driving around looking for a victim right outside the school? Of course he says no, but we will just have to wait and see if detectives can find any connection between these two cases. And like we said, this is a very small suburb of Kansas city. We have car going missing in 2007 in another town not so far away, we have Kelsey Smith going missing and her murder. But then we have another tragedy happening in 2016. Yeah, as we said earlier in this case, Captain, this is a story and a true crime case that spans a great deal of length of time. So we have our case starts in 2007. There's still movement on these cases up to this year. So we don't want to bore anyone with a lot of minutia here, so we'll just fast forward to September of 2016 into the city of Raymore. This is a suburb of Kansas City and not far from the other two locations that we have discussed. Yeah. On Friday, September 9th, 2016, Jamie Runyons calls the Kansas City Police Department reporting her daughter Jessica as missing. Now, in the colonel's recommended fashion that being report your loved one missing everywhere and as many times as they will allow you to Ms. Runyon's very astutely goes to the Kansas City Police Department in person the following day September 10th and again reports her 21 year old daughter Jessica Runyon's as missing so she reports her the night before and then again the following day but this time in person Mother Jamie says her last contact with Jessica was a brief text conversation on Wednesday the 7th. This when Jessica texted her sweet dreams and Jamie sent back a selfie with Jessica's little sister to which Jessica responds sending back a picture of her cat. So the concern started when Jessica failed to show up for a doctor's appointment on the 9th. This was a critical doctor's appointment after an appendectomy. Jessica needed the doctor's clearance to go back to work, so she would not have missed this appointment. Her mother, Jamie, was meeting her there and waited for her, but she never showed, and Jessica wasn't answering her phone. Jamie started calling everyone that she could think of trying to locate her daughter. Now, we will go through this timeline in chronological order, but of course, some of this stuff was not figured out until after Jessica was reported missing and police began looking for her. So Jessica was living with her one-time boyfriend, 
but it sounds like they were on again and off again. They shared an apartment, but more than one source says that at the time of Jessica's disappearance, they were sleeping in different rooms. So we have the text conversation between mother and daughter on that Wednesday night. Yeah. That night, Jessica goes to sleep at her apartment, and again, she and her ex-boyfriend, Jackson, share this apartment. Then later, we learn that Jessica did respond to a post on Facebook on Thursday around 2 p.m. After that, her family received no communication from her. On the last night that Jessica was seen, Thursday, September 8th, she told her boyfriend or ex-boyfriend, Jackson, that she was going to a friend's house for drinks and to hang out. He says that they spoke and agreed to try to work on their relationship. Around 10 p.m., though, Jessica stopped responding to Jackson's text. He says at the time he assumed that her phone had died. Then Jackson, he says he was very concerned when he woke up the next morning on the 9th and Jessica was not home yet. Captain, do you want a little background on Jackson and Jessica's relationship, or should we just keep moving forward? Here? Yeah, definitely I want to know about him. I mean, he's a possible suspect. Jessica met her boyfriend slash ex-boyfriend Jackson when they both were working at the Foxwood Retirement Home. Jackson went to Belton High School, and they knew a lot of the same people. By September of 2016, when Jessica goes missing... Jackson and Jessica had been together for three years and were living together, but as said, the relationship was rocky and they were sleeping in separate rooms. I'm not clear exactly what here, Captain, but it's been reported that Jackson had some health issues as well. Then on Friday, Jessica misses that doctor's appointment that we discussed. Her mother speaks with Jackson at this time. Mom calls and reports Jessica missing, and then the next day, Jessica's mother, Jamie, and Jessica's ex-boyfriend, Jackson, they go together to the police department and file a missing persons report in person. Now, Jackson is going to be a key factor in this case here because he lives with Jessica, so he's going to be able to provide police with some leads right from Jump Street, and this is what he tells the police. Jessica went to a friend's house for drinks on that Thursday. When she was not home the next morning when Jackson woke up, he called the person who hosted the party. This person tells Jackson that Jessica was at the party and she arrived with Jackson's friend, his name, Kyler Use. Scumbag. Jessica and Kyler knew each other from high school. The party host said the people there were surprised when Jessica and Kyler arrived together. Several people later told police that Kyler was visibly heavily intoxicated that night, drinking Grey Goose and wine. He's double-fisted most of the evening. Even more importantly, they say that he was acting possessive about Jessica and aggressive toward the other partygoers. Several witnesses told police that Jessica and Kyler were arguing loudly and Jessica wanted to leave but Kyler didn't want her to go back to Jackson. The host asked Kyler to leave. Red flag. Jessica and Kyler left the party at 11.42 p.m. in Jessica's car. We know almost to the minute when the two left, and you'll see why. Jessica's car was a black 2012 Chevy Equinox with Missouri plates. Kyler, remember... We have everybody saying this dude's hammered. He insists on driving, but when they go to leave, he clipped someone's car in the driveway. So Jessica took the wheel and they drove off. Now the host of the party took a picture of this car incident, which they later showed to police. So the photo was timestamped 1142 PM. That's how we have almost the exact time of when they left. That so night. he hit the car. They told People at the party, obviously, they took a picture and then they let them drive off. Correct. Friends at the party told Jessica to text when she got home safely, but she never did text. Shouldn't let your friend get in a vehicle with somebody that, one, you is so intoxicated that you ask to leave the party. 
and then he hits a vehicle and you still let her leave with this intoxicated guy. No one saw Jessica after that. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks so much for making us a part of your week. So much more to get to tomorrow. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast and make sure you go to iTunes and leave a five-star review. And join us back here in the garage tomorrow. Until then, be good, be kind, and don't let us.